Um, we have finished basically church history up through the imperial church age. We've gone through the apostolic time period up to the imperial church with the time of Constantine. And we are now sort of moving into that time period where um, some might call it the dark ages. <laughs> and I'm, I apologize right now, uh, Jason and I have taught through this before. And uh, this next section kind of gets a little tough. Um, we're going to try to move through it as quickly as we can. Okay, depressing. All right. Depressing, sad. Um, but by the time you're done with it, you'll be really excited for the Reformation. Um, you find out that things can get pretty bad pretty quickly. The one thing that w what we're going to do this morning is we're going to sort of review the early Middle Ages. We're going to look at that and we're going to say, here is the, the big sweep of things. And we're going to talk about some of the background from some of the historical events. But we're also going to talk about the influence on how that affects the church uh, in the East and in the West, where doctrinal issues go, how people start perceiving things. And what's really fascinating is a lot of times we think, oh, people intentionally and willfully went after to do something to create problems. Rarely, as we've said, th is that true. More often than not, little steps of reactions to situations, to events, to happenings, which leads to something else, which leads to something else, which leads to something else, and suddenly you find out that you have a real severe problem. And we're going to sort of trace a little bit of that. So it's kind of like the old, um, the old uh, presentation thing, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. Well, this morning we're going to tell you what we're going to tell you. Um, we're going to focus principally on this review of the middle, early Middle Ages. So this is going to basically get us up to about the year 1000. So this is a review from about 450 to 1000. We're going to spend most of the time on the first 400 years, but in particular then talking about how that affects the Eastern and Western Church. In the other set of notes, this is referred to the ones, this is uh, chapter 26, The New Order. This basically is sort of, if you will, detailed supplement which talks about um, some of the kingdoms, we're going to talk about the barbarians that are coming in. This outlines sort of what they did, where they were. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. I'm going to just reference it. Um, a little bit about Benedictine mon monasticism. I'm going to reference it again because uh, we're going to go through and talk more about monasticism. Uh, the papacy and the uh, uh, Arab or Muslim conquest. There's a lot of details of dates in there. So we're going to overview it and this then will be reference material that will allow you to understand in more detail. We don't have time to go through all of the gory detail of it besides there are a lot of battles and a lot of things that happened. So, as you've been seeing we have walked through and you've seen the the development of the the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire after Constantine. We saw the doctrinal issues, we saw the Aryan issues, we saw Donatism, we saw all sorts of other kinds of things that went along um, with the doctrinal development. We saw the Nicene Creed. We saw that uh, we, we've seen a whole lot of stuff. But that time period is about to come to an end. And this comes with basically the fall of Rome. And between the time of the basic fall of Rome and what was referred to typically as the Renaissance, and again, that's Renaissance as in Europe, not other places. So Renaissance is a very specific term, very specifically to a very specific geography. All right? Uh, because what we're going to see is in the Islamic world, former Christian world, then a lot Islamic world, vastly beyond anything that was ever attained in Europe for a very, very, very long time. We're going to talk real briefly about that. So we're going to again look at from around 450 to around 1000. But this is basically the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, the development of the Dark Ages before the Renaissance. The first thing we're going to talk about is population decline. Now, people sometimes don't think of population decline as something that's relevant or important. But if you have less and less people, you have two things that are going to come about. You're going to have less workers, because remember, we're not talking in the industrial age, right? It's not like, hey, just build another factory, put three more robots in place, and off you go. You can produce a billion more widgets. It was all hand done. So divide the population by 50%. You can produce 50% less, assuming everything was equal, which it isn't. 
And the population decline during this time period is really, really significant. Uh, in By A.D. 600, okay, so roughly 150 years after the effective fall of the Roman Empire in the West, by A.D. 60, we have a population in Europe of about two-thirds of what it was 150 years earlier. So in the United States, that would be taking a roughly 300 million population and cutting it down to 200 million. All right. In, in China, you're going from a billion plus to 600 million. So, so your example, are you talking about the city of Rome that at one point was 450,000? Well, the cities are even worse. Yeah, and it dropped to 20,000. So it became yeah. not yeah. just drop, it also became ugly. Yeah, the, the, the cities basically become almost non-existent. So this is just general population, but as Jason's pointing out, the... In Rome, a 450,000 population in the city of Rome around the time of the last uh, apostle or last, last New Testament writing goes down to about 20,000. For size sake, 450,000 is roughly the size of downtown Denver. Yeah. The Denver proper. Yeah. It has a population of roughly half a million people. And you're talking about that size city all of a sudden becoming the size of not even half that. Yeah. So think about the ramifications of an empire where your capital city basically becomes a small town and not a very effective small town, not a very populous small, small town. Now, there's many reasons for that. I'm just going to touch on them. Again, they're in your notes. There's a lot more detail about it. But climate. Yes, we had climate change back then. We have climate change all the time. Uh, there was about a 400-year time period where the weather got colder not going to go into the climate science behind it, but there is a 400-year time period. What would happen if the climate here in Colorado got colder? Would we be able to grow as much? Would we be able to do as much? Frost comes earlier, snows come earlier, or frost go later and snows come earlier, uh, the rain patterns shift, etc. Climate change. So, therefore, your agriculture is going to suffer. There's a lot of other things that are going to change because of it. Um, that happens, so crop yields drop. What happens when crop yields drop? People get hungry. <laughs> People can't eat. Famine, pestilence. Okay, that's one thing. If you, that was the only thing, the Roman Empire might have been able to survive it, right? Adjust things, shift, import stuff from other places. You know, you can always. It's amazing what we can absorb, right? Your budget can absorb a three percent hit. Tried going a 3% hit times a 3% hit times a 3% hit times a 10% hit times a 3% hit. You know, it gets really bad really fast. And that's what we're going to see happening. So we have climate. We have plagues. We're so used to modern Western medicine. Um, but try turning the clock back 100 years. We're in 2016 now. Try turning it back to 1916. What has happened in medicine in our life? you know, two generations, three generations, lifetime. Yeah, antibiotics, surgery, I mean, computer technology, x-ray, I mean, you name it. Huh? Aqueducts, yeah, aqueducts. Uh, all sorts of things. But think about a time where not only you're not producing as much food, but now you have plagues, in particular things like bubonic plague. Bubonic plague is a, you know, rat born from fleas, typically, and it kills people. And we're going to see, in, uh, there was in uh, 541, a outbreak in the eastern, eastern Europe, and it spread across the continent. And we're going to see that those plagues hit all the time for the next five, six, seven hundred years. And think about that. Now, your cities are broken down, your population's going down, your agriculture's going down, your climate's getting worse. Now you get hit by plague. And in, I think, one instance, they had in one year, the population of Constantinople dropped by 40 to 50 percent. So that means 450,000 down to 200, 250,000. One year. So when you get plagues hitting you, if you notice here, the Roman Empire didn't just fall just because. Um, politically, what do you think is going to happen? Things are going to get so much better, right? Big two. The other thing about those plagues 
was um, literacy, illiteracy rates, yeah. which will play into our priests and everything else. Yeah, we're gonna so we're gonna talk about education in just a sec. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, so there's no rational means. So we start getting all the burning the witches and stuff. We kind of like laugh at it. It's great Monty Python skit. It's true because now that there's people not thinking rationally about it, so it's the rise of superstition and all these other things. And yeah. Now we're just being generated because of just looking for anything and everything. To be able yeah. Yeah, when you when you have no medical solution, again, you have educational drop. We're gonna talk about that. There there are so many different things that start factoring in here. We think that everything works well because it just works well. There are so many factors, in particular stability, that is going to make a huge difference. If your life is chaotic, what can you actually accomplish? Not a lot. Okay. Helpful hint, stop making your life chaotic and you can accomplish more. And you keep going, I wish, I wish, I wish. How, how do I do that? Um, I think we've been someone who's done that, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, my life's not, <laughs> no, no chaos at all. Um, so, you have, you have the population drop, you have plagues, you have climate change, and of course you have war. Because in the other notes, you can actually walk through here. You've got the good old vandals. You know where the word vandalism comes from? These guys. Um, the Visigoths, the Franks, uh, the Ostrogoths, you know, the Alains, the Lombardi, Lombards. There's you name it, you name it, you name it. There is every, oh good, the Huns, right? Attila, the Hun. Yeah, those guys. You find out that Pretty much the Roman Empire from the north and from the east, uh, it's just constant, 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 constant invasions. And a lot of people go, well, gosh, why were they leaving their homelands? Because people from the east were pushing them out of their homeland, so they came into Rome, the Roman Empire, and then, of course, those people got pushed out and went someplace else. And what you find out is people like the Vandals come in, try to take Rome, they fail. They go across into Spain an Iberian Peninsula, uh, they get there and then the Visigoths come through and get them and push them out and then they go to North Africa and go across North Africa through Carthage and Hippo. Remember we talked about Augustine? Augustine dies as the Vandals are sieging the city of Hippo in 430. So you're just talking about constant fighting. Okay, how well does your civilization work when you're constantly at war? Not so good. So if you notice here, this isn't just one thing that's happening. Now, just put yourself for about 10 seconds here and go, if I was in the church and I was a church leader and the government's disintegrating, people can't eat, there's war happening all the time, there's plague, there's disease, there's illiteracy, there's no governmental structure, what's your heart going to say you need to do? Run away and hide in a monastery and ignore it all, right? Fill the gap. Because what is the church going to do? Care about other people. And if you see your brother suffering, what are you going to do? You're going to step in. Oops. What do you effectively become then? Whether you mean to or not. The government. The government. Because there is no other government. Well, we're going to talk about the, the, the good old monasteries, but think about this. The monasteries are organized. The monasteries are disciplined. The, the monasteries have literacy. They can read and write. The monasteries are connected with the rest of the church. So you have a structure. You have communication lines. The monasteries and the monks in particular are honored, and we're going to talk about that in a second. We're going to find out that a heretical belief actually protects a lot of the Christians because of what happens with the barbarians. By the way, the word barbarian means all of us, unless you happen to speak Greek or Latin. If you speak Greek or Latin, you're not a barbarian. That's the definition of a barbarian in those times. So if you speak Greek or Latin, you're okay. Otherwise, we're all barbarians. Th that was the definition, by the way. So when we say barbarians, that doesn't mean these people were drooling and, you know, clubbing people and, you know, <laughs> you know, cavemen. They actually had pretty sophisticated societies. You don't migrate entire large groups of people and beat the Roman Empire if you're a bunch of idiots. But, right? But that's a good point. But the point is that they are also fragmented. Yes, they are fragmented, so though. They have different backgrounds. 
backgrounds and different languages. So even as we're marching through here, one group would come in and then another group would come in and then you have intermingling. And so now you have a completely different culture, a different language, yep. constantly shifting. And so all of a sudden, really, like you're saying, the church and the Bible are the only thing that actually stay constant. Because yeah. they come in with their gods, the next group comes in, wipes them out, and brings up their gods. Yep. And so really, there, there just really is an overturning, a churning of society and people. That, that's why yeah. Europe is such a mess right now, because everyone, well, it's not a mess. But <laughs> the fact that they are all these different cultures, and they're constantly at war, goes back. Yeah, Col culture, cultures that are common, languages that are common make a big difference, right? Yeah. I mean, think about the Tower of Babel. And what happened? The languages got confused. Well, when languages get confused, you can't communicate. You have diplomatic issues. You misunderstand each other. And it's a constant churning. One group coming in, one group coming out. Now, let me give you about 10 seconds on the political chaos. Um, the Lombards come in and attack in northern Italy, and they're there until about 774 when Charlemagne finally, you know, deals with stuff or that, that area. Um, in southern Italy, you got the Ostrogoths, who of course get kicked out for a period of time by Justinian I from the Eastern Roman Empire with his general Belisarius, who was the last major general that actually reconquered land under Justinian. I think we've already referenced good old Justinian. But guess what? Um, plague, oh, <laughs> plague, rise of Islam, etc. all sorts of other things start happening, and so the Eastern Empire has to pull back. And so even there, they were trying to reassert and reorganize, and eh, not going to happen. That falls apart. In uh, the, the, uh, in England, England, we've already talked about, is one of the first places where Rome pulls out. So when Rome pulls out, England is completely left back to the original populace, and yet many of the people in England consider themselves Romans. Think about this. If you came into a country and you were there for four or five hundred years, and the population grows up with your government, with your city. Londinium was actually a very significant city at that time. It becomes a mud, bunch of mud huts along the Thames later on when Cordova is sitting at a population of 500,000. And you're there and your government leaves you. Who do you think you are? The previous group or Romans? You think you're Romans. Well, now the barbarians are coming. So you have, you have a big challenge that's going to go on in England, and it basically uh, falls back in, and you have the Scots, the Picts, the Jutes, the Angles, the Saxons. Um, you get Anglo-Saxon rule eventually by the mid-900s, but in between time you also get the Vikings, the Norse, because they come in there. And so you have all sorts of stuff. By the way, the Vikings play a tremendous role in that. And guess what? The Vikings end up in northern France, and come over in 1066 as the Normans, and they take over England. The Norman conquest under William the Conqueror in 1066 at the Battle of Hastings. And, and that's where Normandy came from, yeah. Oh, Norman is Norseman. Norseman, yes. It's the Norsemen. And now you know why England and France don't get along, because all the people who were from France went into England, but they claimed the lands in France. Then the Franks, who are one of those tribes who actually dominates that region, are now at war with the Norse, who are now ruling England and part of France. I think it was like the 1500s when the last piece of France, and I think it was around Calais, if my memory serves me. Bordeaux. Was it in Bordeaux? The whole chunk of the yeah, near Bordeaux. Yeah, they, they, and, and England finally, France finally, the French Franks finally kicked out the Norman Brits. Yeah, about 1500. Yeah, around 1500 something. A little piece of Calais was still there. See, history is a lot more complicated than it looks. You ought to see a map of Europe and how it moves. There's a really cool one. I'll send you a link for it. Yeah, so it's quite interesting to watch what happens. So, am I giving you the idea of political, economic, social upheaval and chaos. Uh, in France and Germany, which was Gaul, which was basically under Roman rule, eventually the Franks take over, and then it's the Holy Roman Empire,
for a while under Charlemagne around 800 and eventually that splits off and we create quote unquote modern day France and modern day Germany even though modern day Germany actually wasn't modern day Germany until just you know less than a century ago. The idea of the, the, the Holy Roman Empire. Yes, the Holy Roman. 600 years after the fall of Rome, Charlemagne still decides I really want to call it the Roman Empire. Yeah, they want to call it the Roman Empire. 650 years earlier, what Rome was like and who wants to reestablish it like yeah. that. People do not have short memories. Yeah, people want to people want to try to to re, reassert stuff. Of course it gives you prestige if you call yourself the Holy Roman Empire, but uh, in Spain, you have the Vandals and the Alans. The Visigoths eventually come back over. They take over, but they kind of leave things in place. So you have this feudalism. You have some of the Roman laws. You have a lot of the customs. And later on, the Muslims, or the Moors, who are become Muslims, take over the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and they basically come in in 711. They finally get turned back at the Battle of Tours in northern France. In 732, Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer. Uh, yeah, Charles the Hammer, we'll talk more about him. But they come in there and they basically rule the Iberian Peninsula until the 11th or 12th century. And eventually, the French come back. I'm using modern terms here. Uh, the French come back over the Pyrenees into Spain and help the Spanish Vandal, Visigoth, whoever they are now, former Romans. They start taking things back, and eventually uh, Granada finally falls in 1492 to Queen Who and King Who, Isabella and Ferdinand. Okay, so that's the last of the Moors in Granada in 1492. Yeah, that's why Columbus, yeah, so she sent Columbus. So, very interesting, who, by the way, is Italian, not Spanish. Um, huh? That's right. All the all the Italians know that, and and of course Portugal is involved in this too. But they weren't called Portugal at the time. But you know all that stuff's going on. So if you notice here, things are shifting and moving constantly. Um, so you have political chaos. Now, with that political chaos, climate chaos agricultural chaos, literacy chaos, organizational chaos, structural chaos, things are going to go really well for Europe, right? And again, who steps in? The only people who have organization, structure, literacy, communications, agricultural discipline, and oh, by the way, they have that really supernatural thing called God. Except, what do you think's happening with pretty much everybody going on there? Do you think it's, you know, the word of God is reigning supreme? Nah. People start adapting to times and they start losing what's going on. Now, just think about this. Just, I'm just going to give you a modern day example. Here at Southside, we really try to make sure we understand God's word, understand how it applies. That's even why we're teaching church history. Look, God didn't, you know, just stop at Acts, he continued on. He used it. Well, there's things we can learn about how God's word is used or misused. Now, what happens if over the next five years, five years, just, just five years, all the elders are dead for whatever reason, bubonic plague, lack of medicine, pull our hairs out. See, already started. Um, all of our teachers are gone. Half our male population is gone. Most of our young people are spread around. They're, they're the few remaining ones. Our older folks are dead for whatever reason. Like yes, yeah, Plato Modern Movie. Yes, yeah, some apocalypse or something. Your life expectancy goes from mid 70s to early 80s down to I'm older than Calvin was when he died, or real close. You're back down in the 40s and the 50s, and the average life expectancy, like in London at, in the 1800s or something, was like 32. Now, that's average, because lots of kids died. 50% mostly baby died. But once you got past 20, then you could live into your 50s, sometimes 60s. What do you think would happen to the theologic background of this church? 
the growth of the people in this church. And of course, the rest of society is falling apart too, simultaneously. Now you get somebody who's working really hard and trying really hard to do the very best they can, but they have no background, they have no training, they have no education. Oh, by the way, they can't even read the books. This wonderful videotaping stuff we're doing, except I'm already dating myself, calling it videotaping, right? Recording digitally. You can't even get to it because there's no internet. There's no access to it. The books on these shelves are gone. You can't read them because over the time the education starts falling apart. What do you think is going to happen to your understanding of God's word and your application of it? It isn't you're going to say, hey, let's become heretics. People are going to just start falling back into natural patterns. And I'm not excusing it. I'm just making sure you understand these, these decisions and these paths were not some kind of intentional, let's become a bunch of heretics. Reality, and this is happening not over a few days or a few months, you know, the microwave society we live in. We're talking decades and centuries. Things that happen in the 400s come to fruition in the 800s. But the patterns are all in place and they all start moving. And you start seeing all of that stuff. Yeah. And it's like, hmm? you look into how, when you start seeing people that try to combat that and they try to bring God's word to the people, they try to be faithful where they're at with what they have. But they should be given a, amount, a certain amount of grace that yeah. we can sometimes overlook or we can sometimes kind of look down on them thinking, oh, why didn't they just do that? Why didn't they figure this out? Or look what they were doing. Didn't they realize how destructive it was? Yeah. For them, they were trying their best to combat yeah. The situation that they saw. Yeah, if you only have a fraction of the knowledge and a fraction of the information, doing your best still can be wrong, but it's still your best. And we do have to learn to be gracious. Um, so, language. How do you educate people when everybody speaks a different language and it's constantly changing? You have de urbanization, you have no central location. How do you educate people or train people or have commerce? And guess what? As Islam rises, the trade routes are cut off. So Europe stops trading. If you go back and look at some of the artifacts in England, you'll see there's stuff from India in uh, archaeological digs from the time of the Romans. So that's how far trade was going in the empire. All the way from northern parts of England all the way out into India. You actually have coins, you have statues, you have all sorts of other artifacts. China. It was massive. Now suddenly you have nothing. So what do you know about the world? Less and less and less and less. Most people never traveled more than seven miles from their house that they were born in. I travel almost three times that amount just to get here to church every Sunday. Our world would be very small if you only traveled seven miles. Yeah, survive. Yeah, and of course, what happens with that? Your organizational structure breaks down, so you now have feudalism develop. Local powerful people who have some land or some power, maybe they're the one guy left with the Roman sword who then takes over and their family now is the feudal lord. And of course, there's people coming in all the time, and so you as the peasant going, eh, I don't care whether it's Sam or Bill or Sally or Susie or whatever, you know, what do I owe you? I'm not really interested in fighting for anything. I'm just surviving with my family. And it didn't really matter. So guess what? You now have complete disinterest in government and structures. You just sort of deal with it because there's constant fighting. And of course, one Lord's trying to overflow, flow, you know, go the other one. So you as the peasant who your Lord got killed, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm loyal to Jeff. See, I'm loyal to Jeff. And Jason comes in and beats Jeff up, and he dies. Well, gosh, I'm loyal to Jeff. Uh, no, I'm loyal to Jason. Okay, then I'm loyal to Jack, and then to Robin, and then to Bob. Just let me stay here. Yeah, <laughs> leave, <my laughs> leave me alone. So again, what's the one thing that's still standing that you could possibly be loyal to? The church, regardless of how good or bad it is at this particular time. Yeah, hundreds of years. Yeah. That's just the way it is. And anything different than that now becomes, well, it's different. And, yeah. and that's not what we do 
true. That's not how things work. Like yeah. We are we're, we're not good at different. Yeah, we're very good at leave me alone, let me live my life, don't change things, it's scary. That's why it's tough in our world because things change all the time. It gets scary. So, you have isolation also, you have feudalism, you have trade, you have agriculture, you have illiteracy, you have population decline, you have deurbanization, and yet you have the church. And we're going to see some significant things that go along with there. But let me, let me just toss in here, you also now have the rise of Islam, which is going to affect the Eastern and Western churches. It's going to affect the landscape. A lot of people go, oh, the North Africa is, is Islamic. It used to be, oh, North Africa was Christian. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So, Islam rises in the seventh century under, of course, Muhammad. Um, he's basically preaching a new religion. He has interaction with Jews and Christians and other uh, people in the, in the Arabian desert. He says Gabriel is the one who told him about this um, new message that he should worship a single God that ruled and controlled all things and requires obedience from all. Cool. Eh, not quite. But see, and Jesus was a prophet but not the prophet. It's monotheism. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are the only three monotheistic religions in the world of any major. I'm sure there's somebody else that will claim that, but any major world religion. There's only three. Of course, they all come off of the Old Testament because that's where Islam bases itself and then adds the Quran or Quran, however you want to pronounce it, to it. So that's Muhammad's teaching. And Guess what? The Arabs embrace him. They don't. So he has to flee, finds a following. They embrace him. They're very fervent. And of course, if you can't convince them, kill them. So they go on a conquest. And eventually, by the time he dies in I think it's 732, or no, 632, um, he forms his first community in 622. He dies in 632. Most of Arabia is under control of Muslim Islamic uh, doctrine. Now, it isn't just religion though. It's economic, it's political, religious, educational, every single thing about life. So don't think Islam is a religion, it isn't. It has religious elements. Islam is a complete way of life in every way, shape, and form. It's not like, hey, I want to become a good Muslim and I believe in one God and whatever. That's, that's not where it ends. See, anybody who tells you that the moderate Muslim world is, are Muslims, they're not. Not by the Quran standard. However, the militants who want to kill the infidel, guess what? We're not infidels because we're people of the book who in the Quran are supposed to be treated with respect to those second class. And guess what? During the Islamic invasions, if you were a pagan, you were killed if you didn't convert. If you were a Christian or a Jew, you were tolerated. I mean, there were some overzealous ones, but and in most of the Muslim world, Christians and Jews were very tolerated because they were people of the book. They were not supported, they were not encouraged, they were discouraged, and there were lots of penalties socially military, economic, etc. Limitations on what churches could do and not do, etc. But you're going to actually find that Jews and Christians contributed tremendously to the Muslim society, and in particularly in the city of Cordoba. So it's really different than what you think. And when we get to the Crusades, there's all sorts of other interesting things. Now, eventually at the Battle of Tours, in 732, Martin, uh, uh, Charles Martel pushes back the Muslim advance because they pretty much devastated everything up to the gates of Constantinople, all the way through North Africa, into Spain, up into France, all the way across, out into Persia, Arabia, you name it, they had it. They basically won the battles. Constantinople stopped them. In fact, they were, they were scary. Yeah. Tactics. They were really, really good. Legitimate fear that these guys would just come and take over the, 
all of Europe. Yeah, they were ready to take all of Europe. So that Charles Martel and King Charlemagne knew they had to come back and fight him back, otherwise this was not going to end. Yeah, and eventually, because of that defeat, you end up with political and economic and civil war in the Islamic world because, again, it's not just religious. It's economic, social, and political. And therefore, when somebody fails as a leader. Now, that does not account also for the separation early on after Muhammad's death of the split of who is in charge and who is the true prophet, you know, next leader. You end up with the Shia and the Sunni, and of course, then there's also the Sufi, which are the mystics. But you end up with the Shiites. You talk, you hear, we hear nowadays the Shiites and the Sunnis. They don't get along with each other. They're Muslim. Iran and Iraq. Sunni, Shia. War. Okay? Because they don't get along because who had the correct succession? Who is the one who's supposed to be leading? Now, of course, now you got ISIS tossed in there. You got all these, you know, all, this, all sorts of stuff that's going on. But it goes all the way back to after Muhammad dies. You get this split, and then you have civil war, and then you have all sorts of stuff that goes on. Irrespective of, of all that, we can also thank the Muslims for saving all sorts of ancient literature, technology, agriculture, science, developing it. In, 15, in 1453, when Constantinople fall, finally falls, you know who are the principal people in the army? Christians. Interesting. Because they were under the rule of the government. Oh, wait a second, you mean, but they were still Christian. So how would you like to be a Muslim ruler with Christian soldiers? You like it because they're very loyal and God says obey the government. They're very good, actually. Quite fascinating what you see coming out of that question. Have you seen Milko and his says that Muhadi Chakri of the Ottoman Empire was uh, chosen, was taken from Christian parents yeah. specifically for the purpose? Yeah. You know, their parents were killed, the children were raised to be the shock troops of the empire. Yeah, so the shock troops, the Janissaries, eventually we'll talk about them. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting the 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 whole whole dynamic. It's never as simple as it sounds. I wish it was, but it isn't. It's much more complicated. Now, during this whole time period, you're going to see that a heresy, the Arian heresy, actually protects the church in Europe during the invasions. And you're going, how in the world can an Arian heresy protect the church during the invasions? What's that? They're the ones that kind of brought Europe back out of. Yeah. Because now all of a sudden Europe had to start caring about what's happening around them, right? Yeah, they had to they had to begin looking looking outward because things were coming inward on them. Yeah. And eventually, out of that city of Cordoba, which had five hundred thousand people in it, two miles of street lights, the highest level of learning in the empire, etc., that's in Spain. And guess what? That's where all the learning, the Jews and the Christians, and all, that's one of the central places that bring it back into Europe, all of the education from Rome and Greece. And then also during the Crusades, we also see that brings the Greek language back. Yeah, they actually brought back trade. Yeah, they brought back trade. They brought back all sorts of stuff. It's quite, quite fascinating. But let me get to you to the Arian heresy. Remember the Arians about the dealing with the deity of Christ and the nature of Christ and all that kind of stuff? Um, Many of the conquering tribes that came in from the, the north out of Europe became Aryans. Therefore, when the Aryans come in, they're looking at it and going, oh. Or when, when they come in, they're looking at the Aryan uh, influence there, and they say, well, that's fine. That's polytheism, three gods. And then they go, that's fine, cool. We'll leave you guys alone. So the church and the monasteries, instead of being wiped out, were left alone because of the Arian heresies. Later on, the popes start sending out Nicene doctrine and reconverting the people. 
back to a Nicene doctrine as opposed to an Arian doctrine. But because of that heresy, when they came through, it looked polytheistic to them, and the pagans were really cool with that because they were polytheistic. So in, in fact, the fact that, the, that, that heresy existed when the invaders came through actually protected the churches and the monasteries that then get reintroduced to Nicene doctrine. Now think about that. So when you think about bad things happening, that can't be. How could God use that? There's a perfect example of God taking something bad, protecting the church, reintroducing, and moving forward with it. It's quite fascinating. Okay, I'm going to stop here after I get finished with Charlemagne and jump into the church. Uh, but Charlemagne is around A.D. 800. Okay, he gets crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire on Christmas Day, A.D. 800. The significance of that is he's trying to reestablish order, education, writing, schooling, etc. in Europe over his stuff. The other thing that's significant is the Pope, which means father, crowns him. What does that tell you? Church is the top authority. And he is crowned by the Pope as the Holy Roman Emperor. So the church has dominance. Remember in the East, it was the state that had dominance. In the West, the church had dominance. That's why it was so significant. I've mentioned this before when Napoleon took the crown from the Pope and crowned himself Emperor of France. Because he says, no longer does the Pope have sway over France. I, Napoleon, do. So very big shift in symbology. Symbols are rather important. It sends messages. Us, we're like, eh, put this crown on the head, who cares? But that was a big deal when the church does this with Charlemagne. And Charlemagne does try to reintroduce education, organization, structure, writing, church schools. If you're wondering where church schools started from, he set up schools specifically in the monasteries and the churches to educate the people. Because again, the monks were the only people at this time that could read and write because they had to at least know something to be able to teach the people. Now, that's not always the case. All right, I'm gonna stop there with any historical events from it, but let's look at what happens in the East, though. We've seen all of the historical events again. The East doesn't get affected as much, but it still gets affected by problems with plague. It still has wars. It's still fighting for its life. But remember, the Eastern Church was under the emperor. The Western Church, there is no emperor. Even though the Eastern emperors try to oversee the popes in Rome, eventually they have to give up. After the Byzantine fleet is defeated, they have no influence. So again, who, who has power? Rome does. So the Byzantine Empire basically falls back to basically today Greece and Turkey. Had a little bit extra, but that was it. Modern day Greece, modern day Turkey, that was the Byzantine Empire. And that's all that's really left, but it lasts until Constantinople falls in 1453. So some people say the Roman, imp Rome, the Roman Republic began around 515 BC and the last vestiges of its influence fell in 1453. Again, it was a republic up until Caesar, then it became an empire and then it split as an empire and became a different empire. But that, the influences of the Roman Republic out of Rome, that's 2,000 years. Pretty significant. Um, so, we also see some challenges that come in there is that because the, there's more peace in the East, they also have more time to fight, right? Nothing better to do with our time. We don't have to survive. Let's argue about artwork. Um, and they do. They, they, they go on and start talking about the natures of Christ. And then, of course, if you're going to have a nature of Christ, how do, in artwork do you depict nature? Of Christ is it man is it divine how do you do it what happens and you get in all sorts of war and of course there's people that are coming from the Islamic influenced world and the Islamic influenced world 
no images of deity, right? And by the way, never mind. That's a whole other class. Um, we don't have time to cover that. Um, the, the thing that you now see is they've got to come to some conclusion as to the nature of Christ. And that is eventually resolved in the Council of Chal Chalcedon. Now, the Council of Chalcedon is in 451. There is still some West involvement because remember, Rome's not quite dead yet. They're getting close. But what they're going to end up doing is they're going to end up defining that Christ is fully God and fully man, and we can't explain it. Good answer. So they're not worrying about the fights over the humanity of, of Christ or the deity of Christ, which is eventually is going to create other heresies and other issues between Alexandria and Antioch. But um, that's the Chalcedon Creed. That's the important thing. And again, that was because at this time the East still had relative peace. There was no rise of Islam at that point. The West is about to fall apart. So, but they're continuing on with their theologic development. In that, though, um, the Eastern Church is still being controlled by the emperors and remains that way all the way to the end and the fall of the Byzantine Empire. That church that's there is what's referred to now as the Greek Orthodox or Orthodox Church. There is also the Russian Orthodox Church, which we'll talk about later, which is sent from missionaries from... Byzantium into to the Rus people where Russia gets its name, which, oh, by the way, we're also, a lot of them were from the north in the Scandinavian countries. If you notice, Scandinavia has a rather significant influence in, in European history. The thing that, that does come about, and we'll talk more in detail, is a little amendment that the Western church adds. It's referred to as the philoloquy uh, to the Nicene Creed. And this creates a real problem because the East was not invited to participate in the addition of this philoquy. The West said, yes, the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. And the East said, uh, we don't agree with that. You didn't involve us. Anybody who agrees with that or believes that, we don't recognize. Okay, so what do you effectively do by saying that statement? This causes a division. Fundamentally, you're basically saying, we don't recognize you as Christians. The entire yes, the entire Western Church. Anybody who holds to that, oh, by the way, that's the Pope and the bishops and everybody else. We, as the Eastern Church, do not recognize you any longer. Later on, we're going to eventually get to the point around one th uh, mid-1000, I think it's 1053 or 1056 or something like that, that the uh, Western Pope sends a delegation to Constantinople declaring that Rome is the head of the church. And the patriarch of Constantinople says, eh, I don't think so. And so they mutually anathemize each other. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was very graciously done. We're in charge. You aren't. Nah. You know, that's pretty much it. And they both, they both split, and the Eastern and Western Roman and Greek Orthodox churches have not reconciled until even this day. Okay, so you're talking almost a thousand years. Now, in the West, what do we have? Well, we see that that Arianism that protected the church, because a lot of the, the tribes that came in adopted an Arian view, now leave the Western Church intact and in place. Again, communication, language, agriculture. And you get a lot of, honestly, superstition developing, right? You can't fill the gap with knowledge, you fill it with superstition. And superstition becomes tradition. And those traditions become further superstition. And what you're going to see is from Leo to Gregory, you start seeing that the church steps in more and more and more and more into the politics and the oversight and the care 
And unfortunately, you also start seeing that people start relying not on the scriptures anymore, but on the church fathers, councils, and traditions. Isn't that what the Reformation was all about? It's God's word. Yes, there's good things in councils, right? The Nicene Council, the, the Nicene Creed was a good thing. The Chalcedon Creed was a good thing. There was good stuff that, was, that came out of it, but that's not where you put your trust. But over time, the Western church, it becomes more and more about the Pope, more and more about the authority of the Pope, because if you're trying to influence and uh, uh, gain power, you're going to go and say, well, let's go to the rulers of this tribe, all these fractional tribes, and once that ruler converts to Nicene Christianity, then all the people typically do. So that tells you a lot about what real conversion is versus political conversion. Okay, the boss said that's okay. Remember we saw that in the imperial church age? Exactly the same thing. Well, that's exactly what happened. So what's the most important thing for you as a missionary? To get the boss, and do you care how? No. Not really. It's not about the gospel anymore, is it? It's about the numbers, it's about the power, it's about the influence. And of course, if you're the missionary going out there, who are you saying sent you? The Pope. The Pope. And you know what Pope means. What's the translation? The father. father. The Father sent me. And if you go to a tribal <laughs> society, who's the one in charge? The dad, the patriarch. So you're now sending in the name of the father, the pope, that, and once this father agrees, then everybody else should agree, and where's the gospel in all that? Now, that does not mean that the gospel was abandoned, okay? I want you to be really clear on that. I'm just telling you the influence and the drag, right? What happens to churches? Same problem. We're trying to reach out and be sensitive to other people and trying to meet them where they are. Well, that's fine. As long as that doesn't become what your church is about. Right? If I was speaking Latin to you right now, would it be very profitable or edifying for you to sit in this class? No, that's why I'm speaking English. Or trying to, anyway. If I went to a Hispanic church, though, people would look at me going, where's the translator, man? Because it's no profit, no, no edification. So, those are the types of things that we have to pay attention to. The last thing that we have to realize is the influence of monasticism. That influence, we end up with the Benedictine rule, we end up with a whole bunch of other rules. But the thing about the, mon the monasteries is they are where people are. They are communal. They are organized. They are literate. They have communication. They have trade. What happens good out of that? Literacy and agricultural yeah. techniques and all yeah. those with technology and things like that. Yeah. The, the monks are tremendously capable. The early popes are very gracious and caring for their people. They really are. They start getting a big head, but guess what happens when people start um, looking that these monks are special? What do you think you want to do? Because they're there, they're helping you, they're caring for you, they're providing food, they're doing all sorts of stuff. What do you want to do? What's your natural thing? Right? They, become, they become elevated in authority, but you want to thank them. right? These are good people. These are good folks. And they were, for the most part. Until what? They became corrupt. They were too <laughs> yeah, they became corrupt because of all the wealth and the power and the influence they suddenly have. And so the local rulers start getting in conflict with these abbots. And so who, what do you want to do as a local ruler? You can't ignore the church because of all this power and wealth. So what do you want to do as a local ruler? You want to get influence over them. So you're going to end up with this constant war between the pope and the church of who is the abbot because of the influence that they have. 
And a lot of the abbots, in, in they, they weren't celibate, even though many of them were supposed to be, they had illegitimate kids. So guess who they appointed as the next abbot? Remember the rules, you know, obey whoever I appoint? They're kids. And what do you think the local rulers are trying to do? Hey, I got this second son who doesn't have any land to inherit. Let's see if I can make him an abbot. And so now the church and the, and the local governments fighting each other for who has power. Ultimately, you're going to find out that the church and the state separate their powers and say, state, you have rule over your state. I have rule over the church. What do you think is a good way to prohibit people from passing on from generation to generation? It sounds really godly, too. Require that all priests, all monks, all abbots are celibate. You can't pass it on to your kids. There was a practice called simony, which that's what they were doing. And he said, you can't do that. So you ended up with a whole bunch of rules there. So you wonder where celibacy came from? That's where it came from. Yes, there was practice and behavior and good stuff that you could you know, trace in other ways. But that's why it became enforced. It became enforced as the whole position that you have to worry about.